Hello, my wonderful viewers, and welcome to another episode of Betty Adams Over Analyzes. Today we are looking at Season 1, Episode 8 of Glitch Techs, Adventures in Pet Training. Now, before we begin, I do believe I got all the maniacal giggling out of my system while I was prepping for this video, but just in case I didn't, I will warn you that the dark chuckling, maniacal giggling, and just plain weird laughter are a very real possibility in this analysis. The creators really pulled out the mythopoetic stops with this episode, and I just love it to pieces. I should probably give a spoiler warning, however, if you haven't figured out how my video works, videos work by now, then you probably have bigger problems than a few spoilers. This, my friends, this is my favorite episode so far. Just as I irrationally hate the episode where the hero is humble in the course of his character growth, I probably very rationally love the episode where the hero gets his or her loyal non-human companion. Yes, I admit it unashamed, unashamedly. I am a horse girl. I watched Lassie and Flipper and Transformers when they still aired on broadcast networks after school. I love Transformers specifically because at heart it is still the story of a boy and his in search non-human companion here. This, my friends, is the Lassie episode, the Flipper episode, the episode about the girl who tames the beast that no other can tame. Now, be done with the plot. The plot does not matter. Or rather, the plot is the only thing that matters. Remember how I mentioned how closely the plots of these episodes follow the patterns of the seven original stories? Well, this episode pops out of those and goes back even before them. I don't mean that the plot goes back before the seventh, the comedic story, which, unlike all the others, has a clearly defined history, while the rest of them just disappear into the prehistory. No, no, Adventures in Pet Training goes all the way back to the very first story, the Epic of Gilgamesh. In that story, many things happen. It is an epic after all. But the central story, the one that people remember, is when Gilgamesh's best friend dies, and he goes down to the underworld to try and find something to revive him. This episode opens with Allie twitching, not glitching, twitching. There is something wrong with the bright red companion pet that we met a few episodes back. The best friend is dying. Our brave hero must travel to the underworld to rescue the spirit of the father. Or rather, Mika must travel to the underworld to save her pet by rescuing the spirit of her mother. Her mother, who is always mindful of her children's needs, even if she isn't incredibly sensitive. Mika is in many ways the opposite of her mother. From the laden activity board to the many diverse skills of her children, Miko's mother is the living embodiment of orderliness and conscientiousness. Miko is chaos and sentiment. Both of them are full of love for each other, but they show it in different ways. Miko gives her charge, Ali, the ch chicky, empathy and all the finest sentiments. Miko's mother gives her children precisely what the parenting books say they need. The first two episodes of the season showed a remarkably balanced view of where this stifled Miko and where it supported her. It shows Miko's mother coming to the realization that her little girl was growing up and it might be good to let her out of the careful bounds of, con of control and growth that she had set up for her. However, that isn't what these episodes are about. These episodes are about Miko rescuing the spirit of her mother from the Underworld. The show made a big deal about this being the Underworld. Out of the simulation was up. That was kind of a big deal. Also, it might be a reference to Ender's Game, a bit reversed, but that's neither here nor there. What this out of the simulation of being up symbolizes is a theme that runs through the myths of every nation that has ever kept records enough to have stories. At some point in their lives, people realize that their parents were right about everything, or if not everything, their parents were right about quite a lot. The, the decisions and rules that seem so restrictive as a child suddenly appear as the necessary protections that kept you alive when you were young and stupid. The fence you craved to climb over kept you from running out into the traffic. The candy you wanted to gorge on would have given you diabetes by the time you were 20. That one more hour of TV would have led to a lifetime of bad sleep habits. However, no one is perfect and your parents weren't right about everything. It just feels like that when you hit 27. So, you have to dig deep and analyze your life, the beliefs you inherited from your parents, and your culture at large. You have to find out what works for you and what doesn't. You have to find the core principles that allowed your parents to live long enough to raise you and then bring them to bear on your own life. 
In Miko's case, these elements are the mindfulness and attention to rules. Controlling Ali's, controlling Ali's appetite blindly didn't work. Ali needed nourishment. However, letting Ali eat at random didn't work in a much more spectacular way. Ali would put literally anything in her mouth, including glitch other glitches with horrible consequences, and Miko's mom's miso soup with slightly less horrible consequences. Miko has to follow the example of the miso soup from the third episode. You see, miso soup is a fantastically nutritious substance that works on a process of fermentation. It is not just a recipe, but multiple genetically distinct lines of culture that for generations have been passed down through families. That was clearly homemade miso soup too. Miso's mom was literally handing her the collective wisdom of her foremothers in that bag, something Miko's mom had studied and worked to master. When Miko accepted the manual from the creepy dead-eyed pet trainer, one her later, she was figuratively resurrecting the spirit of her mother and rescuing her mother from the underworld. Ah, but you cry out in frustration. There are two texts in this episode, and they get nearly the same amount of screen time. Why are you ignoring Five's character development and his awesome journey with Alpha? Why... We don't mind focusing on Miko's classically trained character development, but won't someone think of Fives? Why are you asking? <laughs> don't laugh, don't laugh. Oh boy, because Fives arc. Fives arc is something else entirely, and I will be doing a whole video on it because it ties into almost every other episode in the series. Now, as a good writer, Will, the writers make everything in this episode do at least three things. Take, for instance, the Tower of Sauron Lake Mountain at the center of the world the texts are sent to. And they were sent, mind that, casts down into it. The tower matches the tower over the bridge in the episode with Five's friends, so the one who got caught by the mapper glitch. Not in detail, but in theme. It's spiky, it's dark, it's, it's the castle of evil. It, but, instead of the Thundercats Eye of Sauron over the tower, this time there is the portal up and out of the game. Once again, the theme of the way out is past the tower. Not over the bridge this time, but still past the tower. That's some weird parallel. They were trapped in the simulation and had to get to or past the tower to get out. Another brick in my own personal tower is suspicion that the tower has a dark and matrix-like secret. However, that will go into my second video along with the question of who and what Alpha is. But remember, I said, everything does at least three things. So, we'll talk about the two of what Alpha things Alpha is, along with the question who and what Alpha is. <clears throat> First and most obviously, Alpha is the X in the equation of a boy and his X that goes into so many stories. It is a fundamental staple of literature. Lassie, Flipper, A Dog of Flanders... Hachiko, and set in sadly real life, the dog with the silver collar found curled at the feet of the boy in the ashes of Pompeii. It is a fundamental storytelling element. Fives now has his ex in Alpha. The second thing that Alpha does is reference one of those wonderful meta memes that this show loves so much. Alpha, you see, is the space Roomba. Alpha is Fleet Admiral Stabby. Let me tell you a story about humans, robots, and the internet. In the far reaches of Tumblr and Reddit, a meme was born of frustration in biology. We were tired, tired of seeing humans portrayed as the boring, mundane, middle-of-the-road species. What if instead of cowering before orcs, wincing at the harsh language of the Klingons, and falling to the strength of the Wookiees, we were the awesome, giant, powerful species? What if we were an anomaly in the universe? What if, what if humans are the weird ones? Some of you may recognize this question. Some of us expanded on human endurance, how far we could run. No animal on Earth can match us for disting running, after all. We can go for over two months without starving to death in certain cases. Our bones are stronger than concrete. Some of us dreamed of humans as warriors, as near-immortal juggernauts. However, some of us notice that humans are just, well, a little weird, a little strange. We have foibles, we have irrational attachments, we have sentiments, we have Roombas, and we act irrationally. Then the streams cross, and somebody taped a knife to a Roomba. He was promptly named Stabby, Stabby the Space Roomba. He perplexed the observing aliens, and he delighted the humans. Stabby was slowly promoted, taking the rank of the last high-strength officer he had succeeded in stabbing. Last I heard, he was a fleet admiral and possibly the governor of a small planet, with poems being written about him. Here is one of the apologies poems, with apologies to the bread-looking cow. I'm Stabby, and I live in space. You brought me to clean up the place, but when you think my task's complete... I half a knife, I stabs your feet. 
In all the chuckling over the ballad of Stabby, a secret was leaked from the corporate levels of the Roomba company. Roomba offers a repair or replace systems for their robots. People in real life were getting so attached to their derpy little cleaning box that they would write the company and demand that their Roomba not be replaced. They would pay extra to have it specifically sent and fixed, fixed and sent back to them. This was their Roomba. They didn't want another one. They wanted theirs back. So, that is two things Alpha is doing. What is the third, you ask? You'll have to check out the Sunday video for the answer to that. On a side note, a theory. We have never seen the pet trainer before. She's never appeared lounging in the training area. The boss didn't really interact with her, and he didn't say they were going to see a person, but that they had a pet trainer back here. She has a plastic smile and a creepy dead-eyed stare, despite her oddly perky attitude. She knew everything about video games, talked in an odd manner, and was carrying a companion pet like it was her baby. Most interesting, she called Miko a young humanoid. All in all, she acts like an AI herself. I wonder how advanced Hinobi's ARs are. Was she one? So, what do you think, my wonderful viewers? Is the Hinobi pet trainer an AI or an oddball? Will Miko continue to successfully channel her mother? What did Fives find in the underworld? Leave a like if you agree with my theories, and leave a comment blasting my theories like a road glitch if you disagree. Check out my Teespring store for some weird human merch, and share this video around. Peace out, my wonderful viewers.